Thomas Jefferson said, a well-informed electorate is a prerequisite for democracy. The following program is part of the series, Influencers and Media Makers. A number of years ago, CCTV sat down with some of Vermont's most influential voices in media, news, and information access to understand their perspectives about the role of media in democracy and how their decisions shape the way we as Vermonters receive information. Much has changed since our first interviews. The people, the technology and social media, the political landscape, and so much more. Fast forward 20 or so years, and in collaboration with Leadership Champlain, we are revisiting the topic with a focus on what has changed, gaps and challenges across geographic, language, and socioeconomic boundaries. The conversations you will hear with today's gatekeepers provide important, varied, and insightful context to the media in Vermont today. Enjoy. We're exploring the evolving role of media and the necessity of an unfettered press for a healthy democracy. In general, how do you respond to that? Oh, how, in general, how do I respond <laughs> to such a, a complex question? Um, well, I think one of the most important aspects of democracy is keeping uh, everyone informed, whether it's informed as to their rights, as they're ever changing, as we're working on laws and policies in the state house, or whether it's just knowing about the candidates that they're electing. Um, it's a it's an important process to know the issues that are affecting our communities, and I think media is both a, a really powerful tool in in both ways. One is really focusing on how we can empower folks to give them that information so that they are able to act uh, more effectively with democracy. And the other end is the misinformation that we see so often. Um, the, the cornerstone of protecting our freedom of speech is allowing all speech, but how do we find this balance of empowering folks while also being able to provide those critical thinking or critical examination skills when it comes to the media that we take in? Excellent. Um, so, how do you balance partisanship, bias, ideology, and propaganda in the media while maintaining integrity to your political platform? You kind of touched on that with the misinformation, but... <laughs> I see we ask really little questions here. <laughs> um, <laughs> a nice uh, Barbara Walters 2020 interview. Um, no pressure. <laughs> no, it's, uh, these are really great questions, and, um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of difficulties when it comes to partisanship because we, we see so many issues as partisan when in actuality I think there's such a gift being here in Vermont because a lot of our approaches on issues are not from a partisan lens but are really from a place of uh, understanding in my opinion and, and what I've seen in the work is that everyone is truly working in the best interest of Vermonters mm -hmm. and that our view on the issues are different. We're looking at it from different angles, but that we are all kind of coming to the same place of how are we uplifting, how are we supporting everyone in the state. And so when it comes to media sources, I think that's the, the crux of the issue is making sure that we're not going to either end of the spectrum, but finding that, that happy medium where it might lean a little left or it might lean a little right because there's no such thing as unbiased media. We all bring biases, but I think an important aspect in media is being able to name those biases up front uh, so that we better understand that writer's point of view or that anchor or that journalist um, so we get more of a, a well-rounded picture of the issues instead of just saying, oh, this is one take on the issue and therefore that is the way that we're going to go forward. Um, almost makes me think of the scientific process. Mm -hmm. uh, so, fun fact, when I went to UVM, I actually came in with a biochemistry major. I uh, really wanted to go into the medical field. Uh, took organic chemistry, as they say, weeded me out. <laughs> uh, went a whole different path. Uh, but what I learned in, in my time in biochemistry is that when you're creating a hypothesis, you're creating it to uh, invalidate that hypothesis. You're doing everything you can to uh, disprove what you are trying to actually prove so that you have the best results. And I think that's a great approach as we look at media is saying what is my point of view and how do I understand the other point of view or others because of course there's not just two stories in the mix. For sure. Awesome. Um, so the, kind of tying into taking away from 
how an anchor or a news um, outlet might have their biases projected and kind of personalizing it for you. So do you feel that you're accurately portrayed in the media and um, like do they amplify your story genuinely or do you feel like they editorialize? Oh, that's a great question. And it's, uh, hmm. I think so often in media, we go to this place of simplification. Mm -hmm. um, and so I loved uh, when I was first uh, entering the race and running, everyone would start the, any journalist I worked with, any anchor would start with saying, you know, we understand that you are way more complex than just a trans person. Like we really want to dig in deeper and not just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And yet every time we would come into the questions, it would always come to, well, what's your coming out story? Um, oh. How does your transness impact the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. And the headlines would always be about trans lawmaker or trans candidate. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that simplification and narrowing uh, is a hindrance to folks accessing the information. Sure. And it's interesting, the conversations that have come up in the state house when folks are like, I, I don't want to sound offensive. I don't want to come off the wrong way, but like, I don't care that you're trans. What I care about is your stance on the issues, right. how you're going to do this work, your leadership qualities as you're coming in here. It's great to see that representation, don't get me wrong, but it's hard to get past those headlines and dig into the meat or the, the protein of those uh, articles because it just doesn't see the fullness. We're complex human beings, right. so to reduce someone to just one identity that we hold, um, even if it is that attention grabber in the, in the headline, it really, I think, limits the opportunities for folks to learn across difference and recognize that, yes, that is one identity I hold, and there is so much more to me beyond that, that one piece. Um, so how and when do you choose to engage with the media when, um, when highlighting issues that are important to you and your constituency? And kind of to add to that, since you maybe, do you feel like you have to circumnavigate the trans identity to get to the meat? Do you kind of like, do you find yourself pushing that aside so you can focus on issues or how do you, how do you navigate that? Um, you know, it really depends on what, what the article or, or what the focus is. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's been a lot of zeroing in on, on the work that I've done in relation to my identity mm -hmm. in the state house. Um, and the bills that I've passed uh, without kind of focusing on the other issues. Mm -hmm. So really the, the two times that I'm, I'm being asked to comment or coming in to the media is around things that are specific to Winooski mm -hmm. and then things that are specific to my identity, of course, one piece of my identity. And so it, it's hard to separate the personal from the political because they are so intertwined. Um, but I think I find even when talking about Winooski, I think one of the the integral uh, pieces of work that we did in the last year was expanding voter access, especially for non-citizen voters in the city. Mm -hmm. And that was also personal, thinking about my own story with my mother who emigrated here from Canada. Very different than others' experiences in Winooski, but still to the core of she's still not able to vote. And so how do I remove myself in that personal story from the story of the people of Winooski? It feels impossible to me. Um, so I think there's an importance of not removing the, the personal from the political, mm -hmm. but it is a, it's a tough balance at the end of the day to find a way to say, here is the important pieces of this, and that's not separate from my identity. So tying in that access, the voter access, and um, your own personal story with your, with your mother and how she, did she, was she an, an English speaker? Yes. Oh, okay. So that's uh, not well, she was four when she uh, came to the United States. Oh, okay. Um, so she had a lot of experience with the English language and actually to a, a detriment of her French speaking. Right. Well, all my other relatives <laughs> speak fluent French. <laughs> it's funny when you lose that in just a, a generation, really. Right. Um, so we have been asking people this kind of this idea of a news desert, and we have a definition of a news desert, but we discussed earlier um, not offering that definition up because everyone <laughs> who we talked to has a, a different take on it. Not, not, they just have a, a unique take on it. So when you hear that phrase, news desert, kind of in the light of um, a diverse community and, like you said, increasing voter access and things to that end to be able to get the information to the different groups who need it, whether there's a language barrier or, or um, an access to technology barrier or whatever those barriers might be that you've broken down in Winooski. How do you define um, a, a news desert, media desert? 
Hmm. You know, I haven't thought about this one before, but what immediately came to mind is thinking of like a, a food desert mm -hmm. um, and not being able to access either a grocery store in your neighborhood or city um, or able to access fresh produce. Um, and so when I think of it in, in that perspective, it's really uh, getting the news that is most impactful to that community. So I know Winooski's own history, we used to have a newspaper that was specific to Winooski, and we used to have publications specific to the city and understanding all that's going on mm -hmm. since, of course, government is existing on various levels. Right. I think so often we focus on the federal level and we focus on even the statewide level of what's happening in the legislature and missing out on those opportunities of what's happening on select boards and city councils mm -hmm. where those decisions actually have a a much more tangible effect on the people of the city. And so I would, I would say that a news desert is when you're not able to access news that directly relates to your community and the needs of your community. And do you think there is a news desert in Winooski or Vermont in general, based oh, on your definition? Absolutely. I think um, it absolutely exists in Winooski, and I think there are some ways that folks are able to access that information, not through uh, typical media sources. I think of what a gift it is to have Front Porch Forum, though it can be very um, <laughs> annoying at times in the various <laughs> posts that come up. Um, but it's also a way of keeping folks informed as to when city council meetings are happening, when budget meetings, uh, linking to presentations so folks are able to come back to that infor uh, information later on. Um, but I think beyond Winooski, a, a majority of the rural parts of Vermont don't have that same access, right. especially when a lot of our media is online right now, um, particularly in Vermont. I think of where I get my media, which is through Vermont Digger mm -hmm. or Seven Days, which all are, I'm accessing them online. Um, if we're watching news, I don't really have cable in the modern day. And so it's all, it's all through the internet is where I'm able to get my best info. And if we don't have broadband access statewide, how are other folks getting that information? Are there still print newspapers in their community? Uh, and the answer is likely not. This kind of leads into the social media question. So, um, you know, in addition to your public servant role, we know that you've got a strong social media following. And so how do you leverage that or use that to um, reach your constituents and kind of as a two-way form of communication, if that's something you use the platforms for? Yeah, I think uh, social media is, uh, again, such a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. all in one. It's a great way to be getting the issues out. Um, it's also a very easy and uh, informal way of being able to communicate with constituents. It feels so much easier to send a quick message via a DM on Instagram mm -hmm. or sending a Facebook message to your representative to get a quick response mm -hmm. rather than, what do I have to write in an email? What is going to grab their attention? What, what do I really want to know? And uh, I found so many folks participate more through social media, especially younger folks, and being able to ask questions um, and to get more information on the bills that we're working on compared to if I was just putting out a newsletter, which every time I do, I get very few email <laughs> responses. Right. So I, I ask myself, are, are people truly reading this? Is this, is this impactful? Right. And yet on social media, there is that kind of direct feedback that you're getting, mm -hmm. um, which also comes in the sense of, of negative feedback. If folks don't like what I'm doing or uh, recognizing that you can't just limit social media to your constituency or to the state of Vermont, mm -hmm. but that there are national reactions to what is happening. And do you tailor your... Um like, do you use social media as a gauge for, I mean, obviously I'm sure for the topics that are important to your constituents, and do you kind of tailor your um, output, for lack of a better word, based on their feedback and their questions, and do you try to kind of direct mm. your content to, to serve those needs based on feedback, or do you kind of have an agenda of what you plan out? Oh, I wish I could plan it out uh, much farther <laughs> than, than I do. Um, I would say there's a, a mix there, w especially if there's significant interest mm -hmm. um, in bills that we're working on. I'll make sure to post more about those. Um, but in general, just trying to get information out as specifically as to what's happening in Winooski. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, 
a piece where it's not necessarily legislative action, that is always my focus, but even community events, ways that people can come together. Um, so I would say yes and. Okay. Um, so yes, it's very, very much tailored. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's always going to be things that people are not going to like that um, is going to stir a little more controversy. And I think those are just as important because you're getting the, the direct feedback from the folks who are following along. Great. Um, this is kind of how we've closed uh, off our, all of our interviews. And then after I, I read this and you respond, I'll, if you have anything else you'd like to add, you, you're welcome to, or if the group has any additional questions. Um, uh, many of us recognize there are major changes facing the media in our current political environment. Even though you're not a media person per se, you're certainly an influencer. With that in mind, what do you see as the most critical of those challenges to overcome? And maybe more importantly, do you see any bright spots or opportunities? Mm -hmm. I think going back to an earlier point, uh, the critical thinking and critical examination is one of the most important pieces of, of current media. And I feel... Uh, really honored and, and privileged that in my upbringing through the public school system that was something that was taught to us how to look at a website and know that uh, to get to its sources to understand that dot com is different from dot org versus dot gov mm -hmm. or looking at media sources to be able to find out where that influence is where they are on the scale of, of left and right and I think that gets lost so often because of social media, that there's almost this training that's happening through using these social media outlets that limit you to 10, 30 second videos or sharing based on a headline and not actually getting into uh, the protein mm -hmm. of the its contents. And I think there are some bright spots in there. It's really wonderful now that social media platforms are starting to lean into that whether it's uh, having on Twitter, if you go to reshare an article, it asks you, hey, I didn't even click on this article yet. <laughs> Do you want to read this beforehand? <laughs> um, or just being able to have that, that question of, "Do you, uh, or the disclaimers, I would say, are also helpful of like, this is not, um, this is political speech, or this has not been fact-checked. Mm -hmm. um, which are important safeguards, but I think it's, it's more that I don't want us to rely on those safeguards. I think they're a helpful backstop, but that we really need to be leaning into a literacy around knowing, knowing what the sources are, knowing what the issues are, um, and understanding, again, that bias piece, which is also being attacked on in the political realm of how are we uh, interrogating our bias in a way that isn't in the sense of, uh, I would say, making it a much larger issue or that it's this liberal agenda and instead saying, we're asking everyone mm -hmm. to be critical about this. I think uh, so often if there is something that I'm putting out there and it's an agreement with someone who is more right or Republican, there's also the left that will come in and be like, well, how dare you share this point of view? And it's, I question it. I go, well, why can I not support this point of view? Shouldn't we be looking for these points of, of coming together and overlap mm -hmm. um, and collaboration? So the question is, do you hear a lot from your constituents about your role through social media? Is that accurate? Okay. And the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> yes, they are. They're reaching out um, beyond just looking at post, they really interrogate what, what is in the post, especially making sure that if it's not just fun, which I think is also really important on social media, is to have this balance of like, I'm a real life human that, do real, <laughs> that does real life things outside of politics, and here are all the things that are happening in the state house. And uh, those questions are actually really fruitful, whether it's a, a perspective that I didn't think about or I think there's actually a lot of story sharing that happens via social media. So people are saying, this is the work that you're doing and this is how it directly impacts me, um, which is something I then am able to carry into the work as we, we move through the policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're at the State House, you feel that politically people are working in concert to move Vermonters forward, regardless of their political views. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Um, it's. Uh, <laughs> 
I think it's so encouraging. I think, I think we get lost in what is happening on the national scale so often that we don't get to really celebrate what, what we value most here in Vermont is, is engaging in those difficult conversations mm -hmm. and uh, understanding that we all live in the, in the gray area. It's not this black and white thinking. And so I think it's more evident in the work that we do in committees than it is on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, the floor is is usually when, you know, I guess I'll reframe this. A lot of our work on bills is happening in committee. And so that's where everyone is collaborating and bringing their ideas to the table and finding a way to come together. And when it comes to the floor, usually you kind of know that it's, it's fully baked and it's going to go through. Um, and so that's where it, it gets a little more uh, partisan. There are clear issues that divide along partisan lines. But there's something about being able to leave the floor and then still have a conversation about what we just voted on. Mm -hmm. And knowing that that isn't, um, it isn't a fight. It's a legitimate conversation. If I ever do a vote that someone was not expecting of me, they will absolutely come up to me afterwards and be like, what were you, <laughs> what were you thinking about in that moment? Not in a like, I need to tell you why you're wrong, mm -hmm. but like, I was genuinely surprised by that and I'd love to get your perspective as to why. And it might change their vote in the future. It might also just change their perspective of like, you know, I didn't really look at it that way. Or maybe you had some misunderstanding there. Can I get you some more information on that? Um, but it, it never feels uh, ill-intended. It's always kind of a, a learning experience that we're all in it together. It's interesting you say that because we visited the State House, and I was personally as one of our days here, yeah. and I was personally surprised at how important the relationship piece was and so that's what I'm hearing you say really it's 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 the personal connections it's that underlying belief that we're all in this together moving the boat of Vermont forward not necessarily you know regardless of our political views and so I was surprised when you said that initially but now that I think back to the relationship piece I'm like that kind of makes sense and then having those discussions after votes it, that's great that does that makes sense that it does kind of boil down to maybe I'm missing something maybe you're missing something that's to your point of understanding being a theme here, like let's get to that understanding. That's so, that's interesting. Which is so different from what we see on the national level, which is like they leave a vote right. and where are they going? They're going to the media first to tell, tell their side of the story or to attack another, mm -hmm. which is only furthering that divide. Why, why are we not having this like conversation? Mm -hmm. And that it was interesting, too, because in my mind, honestly, I would think after a vote's done, it's done. But then, to your point, there's still the opportunity to learn and so, and maybe influence in the future. So that's interesting. So how do we help people whose primary news sources, like the snippets of social media, get to the protein, like you mentioned, of the news stories in general? That's a, that's a challenging one um, because it, it, I think, takes a, a culture change. Um, we've been so, dare I say, in, indoctrinated by social media to have a, a shorter attention span or a, a shorter ability to pay attention to what matters most. And I think a piece of that comes from a distrust that's building in media, um, that when we see media as so partisan, we don't want to engage as much or we don't see it as fulfilling. But I think going back to that, that literacy piece, whether it's digital literacy or media literacy, um, being able to highlight where, where those, uh, those shining lights of hope are in the mix of how are we encouraging, I know, uh, I think back to, again to my time in school where it was finding stories from uh, what would be perceived as relatively nonpartisan sites and really digging in deep mm -hmm. and talking about the, the issues that were either local or national or international and being able to bring all these stories in and just going around the room and being like, I didn't hear about that. I haven't heard about that. And that was when social media was still relatively new. And now I think there, there has to be this balance where we're working with young folks mm -hmm. and saying, you know how to reach your audience best and there is this information that needs to get out there. So how do we find, how do we find that balance? And I don't, I don't know what it is yet. I wish I did. <laughs> what has surprised you, if anything, in your civic leader role? Uh, I think what, what surprised me most uh, is when I was first elected, 
uh, all the questions were like, what are you most excited for? What are you most nervous about? And because of the, the interaction with media, it was this idea that people in the state house wouldn't be able to see beyond my trans identity. Yeah. That I would have to, I ha would have this extra hurdle of, of needing to prove my leadership potential or needing to prove that I was elected for more than just one aspect of who I was. And I think that the surprise was that it, it wasn't that. I didn't have to prove myself to anyone in that building. Um, they just accepted, as they do with everyone else, that like you were elected by your constituents because you have the skills uh, needed to represent your city or your town. And uh, I was worried that there would be a lot of teaching. And not to say that there isn't a lot of teaching and learning that we're all doing in that space, but I thought it would be more work to not only be validated, but also not be reduced to one piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a surprise and made it a, a whole lot easier to transition into that workplace because folks were just really warm and welcoming, um, even through the Zoom land of, <laughs> of starting, right. which is so difficult. It's one of the most challenging pieces was trying to find those connections via Zoom. And every time you went on, there would be someone who was saying, oh, gosh, we just need to get back in person. We just need to get back in person. It's so different. And I was like, OK, I don't need to hear this again <laughs> as to what it's like when we get to be back in person. But it, it was truly fulfilled when we were able to, to go back into the state house, even part time. Um, there was just a different feeling of, of connectedness in those relationships that we were talking about. I think of, but just really grateful for a project like this to be looking into media. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Especially in the, in the context of now, where everything does feel black and white. But I think Vermont has always been a leader in maneuvering that gray. So I think we still can. Perfect. Awesome. If you like this and want to see more, watch the rest of the series. Thank you for watching, and please vote.